So how much radiation would have been absorbed on Zonda 5? Well, let's find out. As Rene was able to establish, 616 flares occurred in September 1968, which gives us an average of 20.5 flares per day. Presuming that all these flares were brief and minor, this gives us a total of 85.4 rad per day. Zond 5 was launched on September 14th and recovered on September 21st, which gives us a total of 8 days in space, which would have resulted in 683.2 rad. Looking back to the CFI, we find that unlike the Apollo missions, no major flares were recorded during this time. So this just leaves the radiation absorbed from their passages through the Van Allen belts. James Van Allen was able to establish that with a tiny lead shield, the radiation was still 100 rad per hour. According to Russia's E.E. E. Kovalev, with no shielding, the radiation could be anywhere from 11,666 rad per hour to 312.5 rad per hour. Giving the turtles the benefit of the doubt, I'll assume that the biological payload absorbed the latter of the Russian numbers. When you add up the two-way trip through the belts, this gives us a total Van Allen exposure of 625 rad. Add that to the dose they would have received from solar radiation, and we find a maximum dose of 1308.2 rad. 1308.2 rad would certainly have posed a danger to any humans aboard, and yet, it is well below the lowest dose the Zonda 5 specimens could take. To be exact, the 312.5 rad per hour figure applies to astronauts aboard a spacecraft with an inclination of 90 degrees. Soyuz spaceships typically launch with an inclination of around 50 degrees, which would result in an outer belt dose rate of 350 rad per hour or a total Van Allen dose of 700 rad for a two-way trip. Even if we add that to the 683.2 rad they would have absorbed from solar radiation, the total dose aboard Zond 5 would still be below the death dose for plants. Nowhere in this Exhibit D series does Jera give any evidence that the Apollo astronauts could not survive a 10-day trip to the moon and back. If I were to pull a Jera, I might accuse him of committing a fallacy of omission for leaving out all the fine details. All his flawed calculations, his outdated expert testimonies, his irrelevant data. Instead, I realized that Jarrah could fill a 20-part series with that kind of nonsense. Hmm. I wonder if his radiation series is any better thought out than his Exhibit D series was. As was evident by his videos on ham operators and Parks Observatory, Phil Webb uses the tactic of attacking acknowledged mistakes that were long since corrected, revised, or outright abandoned in subsequent videos. Basically, he tries to pass off a temporary misunderstanding as a permanently unresolved blunder. It is likely that Webb will pull this same tactic again in response to my Radioactive Anomaly series. I stand by 99% of the information presented in Radioactive Anomaly. The remaining 1% would be a few minor errors that I would like to take this opportunity to amend. Best to acknowledge these errors and correct them before Phil Webb starts exploiting them. Firstly, at various moments, I stated that the South Atlantic Anomaly begins at 500 kilometers, and therefore only Geminis 10 and 11 and a handful of shuttle flights can make the claim of having entered the SAA, as they are the only space missions that can attest to having obtained such a high altitude. Some YouTubers have wrote to post links to various other NASA websites, that state that the SAA begins much lower at only 200 kilometers. If this is true, then this would mean that almost all manned spaceflight missions have flown into the SAA. 
Also, having reread through my collection of books, I also picked up on this passage from page 211 of Michael Collins's Carrying the Fire, in which he claims the SAA begins at 475 miles, or about 764.5 kilometers. This would make Gemini's 10 and 11 the only manned space flights having entered the SAA. As it happens, this region, known as the South Atlantic Anomaly, is where the inner Van Allen belt dips down, and at 475 miles, we will be grazing the bottom of it. In a case like this, in which the stories are so conflicting, one must apply their own technical judgement and scientific understanding to make sense of it all. After thinking about it some more, it was a bit of an oversight not taking into consideration how the geometry of the Van Allen Belt can alter in relation to terrestrial and solar weathering. Lightning bursts and rain clouds are the only reason why we even have an inner belt and an outer belt. The lightning bolts interact with the Earth's magnetic field and cause the radiation belt to, literally, split into two belts. Given these changes in geometry, we'll just say that the SAA's starting point can be variable. So how will this affect those who enter it? This brings me to my second revision. According to E.E. E. Kovalev, the radiation in the South Atlantic Anomaly has a maximum dose rate of 2.5 rad per hour. Plate claimed that the shuttle will go through this anomaly every seven orbits. The Van Allen belts are these uh, regions of high radioactivity outside the Earth, caused by the Earth's magnetic field. Right, but they right. start at 300 miles out, and don't all the shuttle trips go to 300 miles? That's it. Nope, that's not right. There is a dip in the Van Allen belts over the South Atlantic. It's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And the shuttle goes through this every seven or so orbits. Hubble goes through it every seven orbits. They have to shut it down, they have to shut some of the instruments down because of the uh, increased radiation. And Windley states that a transit through the anomaly lasts no longer than half an hour. Doing the math, that gives us a total shuttle dose rate of about 28.7 rem as a result of two weeks going in and out of the SAA. 28.7 rem is not lethal, but it is well above the acceptable once-in-a-lifetime dose for radiation workers. Many wrote in to claim that this 27 rem figure is wrong. Though interestingly, it is nearly one-third more for what was originally predicted for Gemini 10. Continuing with the quotation that we read out earlier, Collins then writes, This we have known for months. But how hazardous our foray will be is not known with precision. The medics have predicted a total dose of 19 rads, which is supposedly safe enough. Later on page 264, he claims he only absorbed 765 millirads, or 0.765 rem, which is still higher than the average Gemini dose. Still, the flight medics originally predicted a total Gemini 10 dose of 19 rem. I calculated the shuttle astronauts who fly in and out of the SAA for two weeks should get a dose of 28.7 rem. Yet the records show that they only absorbed 0.765 rem and 3.685 rem respectively. What's the story here? Well, as we looked at in Radioactive Anomaly, the late former Radiation Health Officer at Johnson Space Center, Dr. Guntam Badwa, told science at NASA that the time spent outside the SAA gives the astronauts time to recover from its effects. Some of this trapped radiation is confined to a region above the coast of Brazil, known as the South Atlantic Anomaly. The space station goes through that anomaly roughly five times a day, says Badwa. The passage takes, at most, about 22 or 23 minutes. That's good, he says. If you go through the trapped radiation belt in less than 20 minutes or so, then for the next 70 minutes, the body has time to do some repair to the damage done by the radiation. The radiation from solar flares can actually do more harm, he says, simply because it comes at a rate that doesn't give the body time to recover. 
If astronauts do indeed heal from the minuscule effects of radiation inflicted upon them within the anomaly, this would explain why Collins didn't receive the 19 rem that the medics had previously suggested that he would receive. Likewise, this helps to explain why shuttle crews didn't show the accumulation of 28.7 rad that I estimated that they would have shown. This heal time obviously deals a blow to certain propagandists and Apollo believers who cite the SAA as proof that humans can survive a trip through the outer Van Allen belt. Shane Killian and Kodak's Douglas Arnold have both made such statements in the past. Okay, here's the skinny. The Van Allen belt is real, but it's pretty easy to get through it safely. The astronauts just skimmed the outer edge of the belt where the radiation is lowest. Even without the lead shielding the wacky video claims, the astronauts only got about two rems of radiation, less than a standard chest x-ray. They're also lying when they say only Apollo went through the belt. Gemini 2 did as well, and the International Space Station travels through the lowest part of it several times a day. Two points, I think, can be made about this. Uh, there, there is a thing called the South Atlant Atlantic Anomaly, where the Van Allen radiation belts around the Earth come down quite low. Now, shuttle astronauts have been going through that since 1981, when the shuttle first threw, without any apparent harm. This is obviously comparing apples to oranges. On one hand, we have a puny region that delivers a very low radiation dose, and the time outside this region gives people time to heal. On the other hand, we have a much thicker field of radiation that takes longer to traverse and gives a much higher dose rate. In the SAA, people are exposed to 1,000 particles per square centimetre per second and receive 2.5 rem per hour. In the outer Van Allen belt, they are exposed to 4,000 particles per square centimetre per second, delivering at minimum 312.5 rem per hour. Actually, 312.5 rem per hour is being generous, as it applies to crews on a polar orbit. Apollo spacecraft typically launched with an inclination of around 30 degrees, giving the crews a minimum dose of 666.67 rem per hour, which is more than the 500 rem it takes to kill a person. Mary Bennett responded to Arnold by echoing what Badwire had said. As far as the ISS is concerned, NASA currently considers that 23 minutes of any orbit going within the SAA is acceptable exposure time to radiation. Not only because the ISS is somewhat protected from this radiation, but also because the remaining 70 odd minutes of orbit apparently permits the human body to recuperate from the radiation effects inflicted upon it whilst in the SAA. But Jay Windley responded by flat out denying that astronauts can heal and tried to pin Badwa's statement on Bennett. The human body does not recover from radiation in a matter of minutes, but rather hours and days. The damaged tissue must be regenerated. If radiation exposure is more or less continuous over several days, such as in the shuttle scenario, the tissue never has time to regenerate before being damaged by continuing radiation. On the Internet Movie Database forum, when pressed on this, Windley arrogantly claimed that his statement was exactly the same thing as what Badwar had said, and that Bennett had misquoted Badwar, claiming that he and Badwar had said some radiation damage, not all, could be repaired, whereas Bennett said all the damage was repaired. This is totally false. Bennett said no such thing. She accurately paraphrased what Badwar had said. This is yet another one of Windley's attempts to try and pepper in the cracks. I am still not 100% sure about the authenticity of the STS-61 spacewalk videos, but after careful consideration, I'm starting to believe Badwar's side of the story. Why else would Windley and his followers need to deny the healing abilities of humans if for no other reason than to hold on to their precious exploitation of the SAA? Now, while humans may be able to heal from it, that is not to say that it is entirely safe. Phil Plate admitted that the instruments aboard the Hubble must be shut down to avoid damage from radiation. 
there is a dip in the Van Allen belts over the South Atlantic. It's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And the shuttle goes through this every seven or so orbits. Hubble goes through it every seven orbits. They have to shut it down. They have to shut some of the instruments down because of the uh, increased radiation. And we have examples of Hubble photographs that have been heavily corrupted by this radiation. This brings me to the subject of camera film and radiation. 